All right, hello everyone. So I'm one of the co-founders of IOTA. And, and my talk today will be about the fundamentals. Basically, why did we create a, a cryptocurrency? Because I think that's probably the biggest question that the financial crowd has. Like, what is the, what is the purpose of these cryptocurrencies? And secondly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about how we actually achieve this vision of a machine economy and how we build our ecosystems. So let's start with the fundamentals. So I think all of you have, have seen what happened in 2017 where these inflated egos basically inflated the prices and the expectations. And so 2017 was a year where we completely lost track of what this technology is even meant for. Like it's not meant to make a bunch of nerds rich, right? But it's actually meant to have a fundamental impact on a society and be a technology that actually drives change. And in 2017, we completely lost this, this focus and I hope now with the crash, uh, the expectations uh, have become more clearer and we can actually start being productive. So let's answer this question, like what is the purpose of a cryptocurrency? Like, Quite frankly, only very, very few cryptocurrencies have a real purpose. This, this whole vision of tokenization, in my opinion, makes very little sense. Like, why should you tokenize every single use case? Like, you get a token for each use case. It will just make our lives much more complicated. So, the question is like, why did we then create our cryptocurrency if we don't believe in this tokenization? This microphone is still on. <laughs> so, so, the first reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the first reason why we create, so why we actually created IOTA is for the Internet of Things. And, and the one, one obvious thing about the Internet of Things is it's not about the Internet, right? It's about these machine-to-machine -machine interactions. And that means we don't utilize the Internet for the communication between these machines. And the biggest problem of today's financial, uh, uh, financial, uh, financial system is that everything goes through a central clearing system, right? Now, the whole premise of blockchain and DLT is that you are able to settle machine to machine and peer to peer. So this is obviously a very obvious use case why you need the blockchain and DLT and why you need the cryptocurrency because you cannot go to a bank, like the machine cannot talk to the bank and say, hey, I want to send the payment to the other machine. That's just completely true. It causes complete friction in this payment system and basically means that many of the use cases are not possible. So this machine to machine aspect is, is one of the major, probably the main reason why we created IOTA as a cryptocurrency. Now, the second reason why we created IOTA as a cryptocurrency is we need to have a standardized protocol for value exchange, right? One of the biggest pain points of, of um, EVs, or electric vehicles today, is the charging infrastructure. So charging today has five different blocks, five different standards. This means that if I, with my vehicle, am out on the highway on a six-hour trip, I need to make sure that I can actually charge on the way, right? And there's a huge, huge infrastructure problem that, that is now only being solved. And, and this is a major adoption problem, right? And we don't want the same to happen with machine-to-machine -machine payments. That's why we need to have a standardized protocol and one cryptocurrency. Because at the same time, uh, we don't want to have different tokens for different use cases, like I said before. Because what that will cause is it will just completely fragment the entire ecosystem and create new clusters. Because now I have a Volkswagen coin, I have a uh, Daimler token, but there's no interoperability between these tokens. And if there is interoperability, it will cause friction again. It will cause transaction fees and it will cause a lot of um, computational, it, re it will require more computational resources. Basically, my machine now becomes a Forex device. And that's not the purpose of it, right? One token, one protocol to actually achieve this vision of a machine economy. Now, the, second, the third reason why we created uh, cryptocurrency is because there's no digital identities, right? So digital identities are, are means to create established trust, right? You have a, an identity, a verifiable identity, and you can share this with another party that you want to do business with, right? Through that, you can actually trust a party and you can then exchange the values, right? But there's no digital identity system today. And even if there were a digital identity system, we would have to have a proper reputation system. So digital identity is already the, one of the most difficult topics. But then you, you, you make it even more complicated by actually having a reputation system. So all of these are unsolved problems that need to be worked on. And that's why a cryptocurrency is actually a, a, a perfect means to, to get rid of the trust problem, right? You don't even need to know who the other party is. You can just transfer the value. As soon as it's settled, the other party can give you the, the, the good, right? And through that, you solve this trust issue. And now the third reason uh, why we created a cryptocurrency and probably the most important one, it goes really back to the creation of, of Bitcoin, is this, this concept of permissionless innovation. So one of the big issues of the centralized ecosystems today is that the single party owns the ecosystem. 
So for example, Uber owns their ecosystem, Google owns their ecosystem, Microsoft, PayPal, and so on and so forth. And there's obviously a lot of friction going on between the, the, the owner and the users themselves, because the users have no say and have no decision power. And the owner can just arbitrarily decide, hey, we don't give you access to our platform because of this and that reason. That is why PayPal has, for example, also excluded me when I was uh, younger trying to actually do business online. Like I wasn't able to open a PayPal account because I wasn't 18 years old, right? So I was excluded from, from, uh, from contributing to the ecosystem. And the whole vision of permissionless innovation, or like the whole premise of permissionless innovation is that you as a creator of your platform, of, as a creator of your technology, you don't really know where, what is possible. The only way to really know what is possible is to form an ecosystem around you and make it permissionless because you want everyone to participate because all of these different, all of these different idea exchange really further matures the entire ecosystem. Actually, makes makes certain products come to life, right? And so, permissionless innovation is the most important reason why cryptocurrencies actually exist. There is no barriers to innovate. Just use the open source protocol and build. And so now, now obviously talking about uh, us as a as a project, right? Concretely, what we're doing. So the biggest difficulty that everyone faces as a as a DLT today is crossing this chasm, right? We actually need to be productive. Everything today is still a proof of concept. Even though Bitcoin has a value of $110 billion or something, it's a proof of concept, right? There, 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 there's no concrete productive uh, 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 use case today where, where, where Bitcoin adds unique value, right? So, so that is why we, we actually need to make sure that these, these, these technologies mature to the point where they're actually scalable and can make sure that hundreds and thousands, millions of people actually utilize the core technology. Right. So when it comes to crossing the chasm, there's three important puzzle pieces. The first is technology, um, the second is governments, and the third is uh, governance, and the third is ecosystem. Now, when it comes to technology, what we with IOTA created is is a new um, structure which is called uh, the Tangle. And so the Tangle is based on a directed acyclic graph. That means that one transaction references two transactions in the history. So basically what we've achieved is that we have a different way to achieve consensus in our system, which requires less resources, so meaning uh, very little electricity. It requires no miners and is actually fee-less. And the way that this works is that every participant in the network, when they execute a transaction, they are also participating, meaning that they're also validating previous transactions that help, help, happened in the, in the history. This means that it's more egalitarian in that sense, because everyone has the same rights and the same permissions in the system. All you can do is issue transactions, confirm transactions. There's no miners and users who have different interests in the system. And like I said before, the, the big advantage here is really that it's fee-less, so I can really do micropayments. I can send one cent and the other party receives one cent. That's very unique for all of the business models, because now it's actually predictable. Right? With, with, with Bitcoin and Ethereum, you don't really know what the transaction fee is going to be. And it's scalable. And, and so here's an example of what the Tangle looks like when it's actively working. So here we can see users issuing transactions and confirming transactions. And obviously, we are still in the early stages of this technology. Like we started in 2015, we're developing it. And, and now we are starting to, to really mature us as, a, as an organization, us as a, product, a project. And the most important component is obviously, obviously this production readiness and the standardization. And the only way to actually be production ready is to become a standard. So it's like a catch 2022, 20, right? Catch 2022. 20, uh, right, and so the way that we are approaching this is, is really to involve a wider ecosystem and by having a, a, a foundation behind this entire protocol. And so we are the first ones to have a nonprofit foundation in Germany. It's called Gemeinnützige Stiftung, quite a difficult word. And right now, we are nearly 90 people in this foundation that, that are focused exclusively on really building the technology, standardizing it, and building this ecosystem around it. Uh, so when it comes to the ecosystem, we always say that we build technology um, for the industry and with the industry. Because one thing that, that all of us in this room can agree on is technology is advancing too fast. Right? Even though I'm 24 seven in this blockchain space, there's still new stuff happening that I don't know about, right? So other people have to tell me, right? So there's just too much information to digest for a single entity, which means that we actually have to come together as different stakeholders, because first of all, everyone has different interest, uh, uh, has a common interest, but they have that, uh, very different skill sets and expertise. And combining this expertise can actually lead to this ultimate goal, which is for DLT to be productive.
So we in our ecosystem are really focused on bringing these different stakeholders together to actually innovate. So we work together with some of the largest companies in the world and we focus primarily on, on supply chain. Basically, how can we make, how can we apply our technology supply chain tracking and, and, and making the entire value chain more transparent. We focus on Industry 4.0 basically uh, a manufacturing as a service or, dig or, or digital twins and, and digital audit trails, uh, mobility, car wallet, uh, car is, uh, mobility as a service and so on and so forth. And we are also really focused more on smart cities now. But obviously our technology can be applied to all of these different sectors and that's why we call it an open innovation ecosystem because everything that we do is open, everyone can access it and can just build with it. And, and I think uh, one of the key components or one of the key developments of 2019 will be that it will be less about proof of concepts, right? In the last few years, it was all about doing proof of concept and it's kind of getting boring. And so what, what's exciting about the entire DLT ecosystem for, for next year is that we're really focused on testbed pilots. Having test beds where we can actually apply the technology, can apply the use case and figure out what works and what doesn't. Because the technology is still in this early stage where we need to further develop and advance it. And the only way to do that is to have test beds, right? We have this for autonomous vehicles and it's time to have the same for distributed ledgers. So this is something that we are concretely focused on. Uh, a, a specific example is the CD Exchange uh, program which was funded by Horizon 2020 where IOT is one of the technology providers where we are now developing different um, smart city use cases, specifically focused on energy, in seven different cities. So the project will kickstart next year, and, and everything that we do will be, will be openly shared so that the wider ecosystem can also benefit from the results. And one last point that I wanted to make is, we, we as a foundation are there to really be the glue and the, the, the party in this ecosystem that fosters it, basically the enabling party. And one of the unique ways that we are doing this is with our ecosystem development fund. So unlike traditional VC funds who take equity in a startup, we have a fund set up with about $10 million who is just there to foster open source uh, pro uh, projects. So basically what we do is we, we have people apply to us and we just give them money to develop their, their tools. And this is obviously one way to really grow the ecosystem by having open source toolkits, libraries, and so on and so forth that benefit the entire ecosystem. And I think we are the only ones who actually developed such a fund and are running it right now. And it's a subsidiary under the, under the foundation. And as a final remark, I, I think all of us can agree to this, that, we, that we, we don't need to, we should not repeat the same mistakes of 2017. And over the next few years, we should really focus on being productive and making sure that this ultimate goal of DLT actually having an impact on life is realized. Because I always say the worst thing that can happen to cryptocurrency is that all it did was enrich a few nerds. Right? So yeah, that was my presentation. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for presenting. Um, I'm curious, so you say you're focusing on uh, supply chain. I, I believe that blockchain has a great application in, in supply chain, uh, basically verifying that you don't get counterfeit parts in your assembly that you're building for whoever you're building it for. I'm wondering, like, how, who are you partnering with to work on that, and uh, what, what stage are you guys at in that development? <clears throat> So, so we, we have some working products already focused on, on manufacturing, basically having a, so what we did, for example, with Fujitsu for the Hanover Messe was having a toolkit, having a, a robotic arm that can actually verify the parts that it's processing. So this is already a working implementation that, that we've showcased there. When it comes to supply chain, right now we're running several proof of concepts together with some larger corporates, but I obviously can't mention them yet. But what we are focused on is being this digital audit trail. You input the data, each, each event that happened in the supply chain, each data point onto the tangle, and then you make it verifiable. So we are focused on basically being such a module. Uh, we don't focus on trade finance. Like IOTA can be really well combined with, with other applications or uh, technologies like Hyperledger, which focuses more on trade finance, right? Supplying this verifiable data to another blockchain to make financial decisions on, basically. Hello, my name is Deepak. And uh, I'm curious to know if uh, you can think of any applications relevant for this room, uh, for example, using IOTA for uh, central banks to open up account for a whole country. Um, so micropayments, 
is, is kind of an obvious one because micropayments is one of the things that the financial sector does really terribly right now. And so having a, a system where it can actually pay per, per usage unit, pay per whatever, is, is a big use case. One example that's very relevant to, to the banking sector because of BS, PSD2 is pay per API call. So basically you have an open API, but it's actually monetized, right? You pay per API call that you make and it's only a tiny micropayment. And that's a very interesting use case for the financial sector. Or audit trails is a huge run, right? We, we talk about triple entry accounting and, and putting additional data onto, onto a technology like the Tangle so that it becomes verifiable for third party auditors. Or, or settlement between companies and so on and so forth. That's quite a lot of use case in the financial sector. Uh, I have a question regarding the micropayments and the machine to machine payments. Um, will the asset that's or the coin that's being exchanged will it be stable in price? That's that's the biggest adoption difficulty of any cryptocurrency, right? Right. So so we we're talking about the fundamentals of cryptocurrency, and the biggest adoption barrier is definitely the price volatility, right? And and we we're working on a few ideas to actually resolve that. But obviously, with more adoption, the, the, the price becomes more stable. With more liquidity, the price becomes more stable. So we focus on such inif initiatives. But at the end of the day, the whole premise of a cryptocurrency is that it's not tied to any specific value, right? It's not a stable coin, and it's not a um, uh, uh, digital US dollar, and so on and so forth. Because then you go away from this whole permissionless ecosystem aspect again. Yeah. It's a tough problem, and everyone has the same issue. Thank you, very interesting. Um, I, I was wondering at this proof of concept stage, how much do you focus on, well, you, you, you spoke about the um, ecosystems and one ecosystem is able to um, stop you from entering it. And IOTA is maybe something else, but on a protocol level, there's still like either you use it or you don't. So in case of data protection or um, other personal rights, um, how, mu how much, how, which role do they play in this proof of concept stage? You mean GDPR and stuff like that? Yeah. So, so obviously we want to be an open protocol. So, so at the end of the day, everything is open source and we don't, like, we don't develop our protocol around GDPR, I think. I think that would be our mistake, right? And so at the protocol level, we don't, we don't do anything like that because it's just open source free software, right? Or like, what do you mean specifically data protection? like rights to get stuff removed or, or what exactly? Yeah, for example, that uh, does it play a role? Um, no, but then it's no longer a permissionless block, a distributed ledger, right? If you have the, the ability to remove entries, right? So it loses the whole premise behind it, the whole premise. Yeah. Well, I just think it's very hard to change a protocol after it's like fully manufactured. So I was wondering, um, prospectively, the protocol, if it scales and it's being very hard to change it. Right. Um, so, so we think very thoroughly about that. And, and we have a few blog posts about GDPR as well. Uh, but, but we have no intention of changing the core protocol according to GDPR. Okay. There, you mentioned that one application um, would be also in governance. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit more about the ideas? Um, how Which application? The governance, one of the three main aspects oh, yeah. of mentioned was governance. And um, regarding the e-identity um, um, or identification that can follow you, um, do you see any problems with like surveillance um, issues or anything like that? Uh, so, so to answer the first one, so we have a non-profit neutral entity behind uh, the, IOTA, uh, the IOTA protocol, right? So this, this is how the current governance structure works. And we are, we are right now working on a new structure whereby the ecosystem and the industries have a better representation. So that is something that we're working on. But apart from that, we are, we are, we are also focusing more on how the protocol will be upgraded and how we can work together with, with more traditional organizations that have a vetted process for code contributions, how the legal stuff happens around these code contributions, so on and so forth. So that's, that's something that we're actively working on right now. You might have seen that Trinity went on Eclipse. That's an example. So the second one, digital surveillance, I don't think that's going to be a huge issue there because obviously the, one of the key aspects of these new digital identity protocols is, is also that you have new encryption means, like homomorphic encryption where you can actually just verify a certain statement without revealing your data, so it will be much more, much better in terms of data protection. 
But other than that, I don't think it's going to be a big thing. No. I think we should wrap it up here, yeah.